Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the Mad Mamluks. I'm Mahin and I'm here with my co-hosts, Sheikh Amr Saeed and Sim. Today we got a very special guest all the way from Houston, Texas. You know, man, we love Houston, man. We've had Mujahid Fletcher, Irtiza Hassan, Joe Bradford on the show. Now we got Amara Shukri, who is an instructor for the Maghrib Institute and also a spoken word artist and good friend of mine, brother that I've known for over a decade now. So Amar, first of all, uh, now you got a tight schedule and a flight to catch in a couple hours. So appreciate you coming through. Assalamu alaikum, ahlan wa sahlan. What's up, my mad mom Luke's? Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> We're mad. Yeah, I'm mad mom Luke's, mashallah. Yeah, Amar, you remember we first met in 2000, I remember it was 2005, it was fall. And I, I walk in the, you came to Ohio State Juma for some reason. We I was an undergrad there. You know, and we, I walk in and I see some dude, and you got a signature of this white kufi all the time. Like, I don't think I've ever seen you without it. Was it, uh, it was, uh, it was probably 2005. I was, uh, I had a college job. I was hustling for, for Elm Quest back in the day, the good yeah. old days. Yeah. You sold me this expensive CD set called Unbreakable, which was, was a pretty it good, was, it was an amazing CD set. That was the, the New Jersey Dawa Conference 2005. I still have like a copy of that set. Whatever happened to Elm Quest? Uh, I think Elmquest uh, had some issues. I mean, what happened to the CD industry in general happened to yeah, the oh, Islamic right. <laughs> happened to the Islamic CD industry as well. So, yeah. uh, but it was a beautiful time, man. I was I remember traveling with uh, these CDs, going to different conferences, and um, being able to meet people like yourself, and you know, listen to all of these CDs for free. Which was it was a great deal for me at Hamdir. Remember, was awesome. brother Khalil, I think, was there from Houston. Yeah, he was. Uh, he was. He, he was editing all of the content, and uh, there were a lot of others that were involved. But uh, uh, yeah, Columbus, Ohio, two thousand and five. Yeah, I remember all that Somali food we were eating. You know, the one thing I remember because you were you were at UConn. Were you still at UConn back then, or you had yeah, finished UConn? I was a husky. Yeah, so UConn. You know, for our listeners, if you don't know about sports, their college basketball team is a powerhouse. Like they was a legit dynasty. It, Amount, I mean, they win, every, they win every year. I mean, they had their girls' teams win for four years straight, and their star player win the finals MVP for four years straight. And even the men's team will come out of nowhere and win the championship every other year. Yeah. Being, like, from out of nowhere. What's interesting, though, is that with that school being so famous for basketball, I never went to a single game. Like, wow. Everybody, everybody goes to the games, and I never went to a single game. But you were com- I remember you were driving. It was game day at Ohio State that weekend because it was a Yasser Qadi Land of Guidance class. Oh, and I remember. you remember like how all the tents were piled up like two miles from the stadium. Like people were parking two miles away. So and you were like, "This is no UConn basketball can't compare to this." I I, I got to show love to my Buckeyes though. So so <laughs> so when you go to college campuses, it's really you know interesting just how cultish some of these college campuses are. So when I went to Ohio State, I remember the strange thing to me was. You walk up to somebody and you say, O-H. I-O. Exactly. They'll respond. It's like, salam alaikum, alaikum salam. That's how they do it. So you go up to anybody and you say, O-H, and they're going to respond and say, I-O. And that, to me, was like so strange. And then I didn't know cultish until Texas. Texas A&M. I was just there two weeks ago. Texas A&M, agriculture and mechanical. They are... These guys have tradition after tradition after tradition where if you don't participate in the school's traditions, they consider you to be a two percenter. Mm. A two percenter is basically their way of saying you are khawarij. You are <laughs> not involved. You have turned away from our sunnah. They have their own dorms. They're like thrown away. They don't participate in all of the rituals. And they have a lot of a lot of rituals and a lot of traditions. And so, uh, yeah, college uh, the college experience is... is uh, Alhamdulillah, sometimes you're just happy to be from the Northeast. <laughs> no doubt. And you, you guys got the Yankees and stuff out in New York. So, Al Maghrib, right? That's Thank you, by the way, for giving us Derek Rose. I really appreciate it. Yeah. He's about right. to go to jail, though, right? I, I, I haven't been paying attention to <laughs> all of that. He's about to go to jail, all right? Throw you, that in there. Did you hear that? <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just saying, just throw that in there at the end when you're talking about Thank you. I mean, yeah, we're smart, man. We, 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 were, we knew when to unload him. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, you were saying something. Yeah, so Al Maghrib, you know, that's where we, we met in that context, and then you were the Amir in the Kabila in New York. We, and we our listeners know about Kabilas because we had Ertaz Hassan on the show before. And yeah, now so, you're an instructor, so like, talk to us a little bit how this transition. Like, all of a sudden, you jump out of nowhere. That's like me being an instructor, man. Al Maghrib probably I, never. I, I, I mean, I put in work, man. <laughs> I put in work. So uh, the the Kabila system is um, the Kabila system is a. 
uh, you know, it's a student tribe system. And when I became the, um, when we brought Al Maghrib to New York, and so Al Maghrib has traveling seminars, and it only travels though. The only way you can host a seminar is if you qualify as a student tribe, meaning that you have enough volunteers and you have a community that's willing to sustain the system of Al Maghrib, not just one time. It's not, in, it, it's not interested in coming to your city one time and just doing a random event and then leaving and never showing up. Al Maghrib will only come to your city if your city will actually be able to sustain the seminars continuously. And so we had to, I remember we spent an entire year you know, trying to prove to Al Maghrib that New York could actually handle Al Maghrib seminars. And so when it eventually came, I was the first Amir of the uh, New York chapter, our Qabila or our tribe or our city was called Qabila Tayba. And, um, you know, even before that, I was just so amazed when I first went to New Jersey because they already had an existing tribe taking the light of guidance with Sheikh Yasser Qadi as my first class, and it was my favorite class until now. And uh, it had it never, I've never been exposed to Islamic knowledge in that level, on that level of academic uh, presentation. And I remember actually being in Sunday school, uh, you know, years before, actually feeling like, why is it that when I go to high school and I'm being taught biology or when I'm being taught uh, physics or what have you. I'm being taught by people who have at least a master's degree in that field. But when I go to study Islam, which everyone is telling me is the most important subject, I'm being taught by, you know, uncle so and so who's an engineer. And, you know, Jazallah khair, may Allah reward them for, for putting in that effort, but they're not specialists in that field. And I remember not feeling like I didn't have access to specialists. And so, you know, finally being presented material by a specialist in their field who can articulate and who can present. And you can tell that there's so much effort and so much planning that's put into the, and professionalism keyword that's put into the uh, presentation. It, it was mind blowing. And I never looked back after that. Especially how well al Maghrib does a lot of their presentations. It seems like they take a lot of care and thought and, and planning the the entire image of the classes and, and whatnot, it all seems like it's very polished and yeah, it seems polished, like, yeah. yeah. I remember that last Ilmquest, uh, Ilmfest that we went to with Sheikh Yasser Qadi and the stage was rounded and it was, you know, everyone was walking, the, he, as him as a speaker, he was walking in a circle. No one really did it like that before. Oh, yeah, we didn't see like, an Islamic it, it presentation. Looked like a, it looked like a TED talk. Yeah. And we didn't see, we've never seen an Islamic presentation like that right. before, you know, and it was very polished. Yeah. And the idea is always to, you know, if you if you guys remember back then, flyers were being done on Microsoft Word for events, yeah. right? And so Al Maghrib came out of the box with these really, really well done graphic design uh, or, or or graphics for their for their seminars, and it was just very attractive. It was very, um, you know, it 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 it, um, it excited people. And you have to always be continuing to to innovate, you know, in yeah. the good way. Always being able to innovate to bring people to. You know, and making Islamic information accessible and attractive in the way that people uh, people respond to. And uh, I think one of the best things that I've learned through this journey is that you always have to fall in love with your um, you have to fall in love with your audience and not fall in love with your business model. So uh, falling in love with your audience means I f look where they are. And if they're on YouTube or if they're on iTunes, then I create a format that can be uh, consumed by them on iTunes and on YouTube, right? Because I love them. I don't love necessarily the, the halaqa that I give or I don't love the, you know, the way that I've done things over the past 20 years. And having the ability to always review that and, and, and make your concern the people that you're trying to present to as opposed to your method of presentation will always allow you to continue to innovate. Yes, sir. So now we talked about New York a little bit, right? How do you, you know, describe the Islamic atmosphere? And we know about Imam Siraj and Masjid Taqwa. But one thing I want to hit on real quick, and our, our Mamluk listeners know about this, that we're not afraid to talk about, like, some of the groups and their issues. And we always try to bring that bring that together here and try to be relevant. But Noman Ali Khan, when I first met him in 2007, he said that the thing about New York is that you got all, you got like all 73 sects on one street <laughs> and you have the most hardcore version of them on that same street. That's so right. So how do you, how do you run Al Maghrib in that kind of environment? Like talk to us a little bit about you, the dynamics of Islam in New York. So New York is, uh, New York is, is, uh, just like everybody 
expects it to be. It's rough. It's tough. It builds character. It, you know, builds hustle. It does all of these things. And, um, one of the interesting things about New York, and I didn't realize that I just thought this was the way that it was everywhere until I left New York was that New York is one of the, and by left New York, I mean, just traveled outside of it, we go and visit other cities. When you, um, when a person immigrates to the U.S., New York is their first stop most of the time, right? Um, they, they stay there for two months or three months or five months or six months until they get a footing into the country and then they travel somewhere else. They go to Houston, they go to Chicago, they go to wherever. There are a lot of people who travel to New York and stay in New York. And the reason why they travel to New York and stay in New York is not because of lack of opportunity in other countries, in other cities, but because in New York, you can be Egyptian like you were in Egypt hmm. and 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 you'll be able to get by. You'll be you can be Chinese like you were in China and you'll be able to get by perfectly fine. You don't even need to learn English for many communities in um in New York. Now, I thought hearing Arabic khutbas all the time was normal and going and hearing Urdu khutbas or bayans and hearing Bengali if you go to that particular community and until I went outside of New York and I find that all of these people find that to be incredibly strange because no, you're supposed to give your khutbas in English because you're living in America. And I'm like, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> you should be able to. Um, and then that conflict was created, um, you know, between the, the younger generation and the older generation in New York. And it's existing until now, although more of those massage and those communities have kind of you know, um, bow to the tide of, of, of wanting English programming and wanting English hold buzz or things like that. But in New York, it was very much the immigrant presence is very, very strong and it's very, very fresh because it's, there's always an influx of people coming in. Hmm. That's one of the things with regards to New York. Other things that, you know, are very prevalent in New York is, uh, the prevalence of, uh, counterterrorism in the, in New York. So that's something that's just very, 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 um, obvious, you know, the NYPD and all of these, um, you know, uh, government agencies. And so one of the things that I've noticed when I've left New York or when I'm not in New York is just people are much more calm with each other. I see. People are much more relaxed with each other in Masajid. In New York, if a person comes up to you and asks you two questions out of the blue, one after the other, that's two, that's one too many questions. So I, I haven't been to New York uh, except for once, but if I was to come to you and you didn't know me, I said, Salaam alaikum, how are you smiling? And I'm just standing next to you. And some people how do are you smiling? That's fine. What's your name? Followed by what do you do? That's too much. Okay. So if I'm just some guy who's new there and I just want to just hang out with somebody because you're not going to suspect me of anything, right? Because of the environment? No, I, I would. Oh, you would? Yeah, okay. yeah. If you, it depends on your level of... Uh, your level of of uh, abrasiveness, abrasiveness, <laughs> as well as how much you want to hang out with me. Okay, I see. Right, I so see. it could, be, and and that's a horrible problem to have, right? Because uh, these religious institutions are supposed to be places where people can come broken and and be fixed, and yes. they can come lonely and find companionship and friendship. Yes. But the 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 nature of you know the the the, the political atmosphere. Um, in New York is that the Muslim community is very, very, very extremely conscious of who they allow, not into their inner circle, but into their general circle. Wow. Like who you give your number to. That's wow. like an issue of, of concern there. Do you think that's hampered Dawa in general? Um, because when I hear California, I hear Texas, I hear Illinois or Chicago. We hear of several groups and organizations that, that come out of these states, um, and I'm, if I forgive me if I haven't mentioned your state, uh, but in in a general sense, where the Muslims are of, at the highest population, you would think there would be so much more Dawa, Dawa, and organizations being established from New York. But I, I don't, I can't even think of one off the top of my head that is really well known uh, in New York, unless you can. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, I mean, there are, alhamdulillah, there are a lot of organizations that are involved in New York, but they're, they may not necessarily be ahead of the curve when it comes to making themselves known on the national level or being on top of social media. But there are some organizations that, you know, have, um, I don't know, people know like Linda Sarsour and stuff. I think they're from, uh, East Coast. Yeah, area. she's from New York. She's from Brooklyn. Yeah. Uh, there's, uh, you know, the ICNYU, 
uh, with Imam Khalid Latif. So these are a few institutions that are known. But by and large, if you're talking about on the national scale, um, New York doesn't really have, um, you know, like these celebrity imams. Right. And those celebrity imams, they won't live in New York because New York <laughs> is extremely expensive to live in. It's very hard for you to even... I mean, and even New York continues to get more expensive every single year. It's absolutely insane. Hmm. I was trying to explain to a person uh, yesterday that if you commute from New Jersey, which many people do, it's just, it's literally like, for example, someone from Indiana commuting to Chicago. I mean, I'm sure lots of people do it. You have to pay a toll, um, $15 going one way. And if you're coming back through, the, the the same path, right? Yeah. You will pay another ten dollars. So you're talking about twenty five dollars in tolls that you're paying just to make your daily commute. And then you're not talking about gas, and you're not talking about rent, and you're not talking about all of these things, um, and you're not talking about income tax and city tax uh, for That's living insane. in New York. So it just gets really, really, really expensive. And you're, if you're talking about duhat and imams and things like that, I mean, their salaries aren't going to justify them living in, you know, one of the most expensive cities, if not the most expensive mm. city in the country. So, right. Makes right. Sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So unfortunately, you have a lot of. But then again, if you look at a lot of the talent in this in the country now, you'll find that they're from New York. You know, <laughs> I'm not. You, yeah. know, you have Norman is is uh, brother Norman is from New York. Norman yeah. Al Khan, you have um, you have Ustad Sam Sharif. He's from New York. Yeah. You have a lot of people who are. Um, you know, doing a lot of work in this country who are are, are from New York. So it, it they leave New like York a, and then... A lot, a lot of these uh, talented individuals kind of have to escape the big city because it seems like uh, big cities like Chicago and, and New York and L.A., they, being in, in those communities, it seems like your voice gets drowned out a little. Very much so. And I can tell you, you know, as soon as you are 17 years old in New York, if you speak well, you can give a good khutbah, you will get put in the meat grinder, and you will never know when you come out, right? Yeah. And so people complain of fatigue and exhaustion because they're not building themselves up. You don't really have, um, there's, for example, um, New York is like Chicago, maybe uh, where you have a lot of um, MSAs. You have a lot. There are some cities that don't, they just have one MSA. They just have two MSAs, like major American cities that have three or four. That's it. Hmm. So New York, you've got all of these colleges, you have all of these MSAs, you can have your schedule filled with events and events and events and Jum'a khutbah every single week because there's over 100 masajid, if not more, probably close to 200 now masajid, if not more, um, where you can go and give khutbah and you can go do Friday nights and you can go. And so before you know it, a year passes, two years pass, three years pass, and you haven't learned a new surah of the Quran. You've just been going with what you've got. Yeah. And what you've got is enough until you realize that your life is passing and you haven't really, uh, you yourself haven't become better or stronger. Hmm. So people then feel like they have to disconnect or they have to move where they can build themselves up and hopefully come back to New York. But then again, when you taste uh, how cheap rent is in other places, they may never come back. You know, one thing about New York, they say if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere, right? Do you think some of these people who leave New York, they they have a competitive advantage just by being used to that grind when they I, leave? I believe that 100%. Hmm. I believe that 100%. I mean, not just New York, but from any of those types of cities where it's very hustle and bustle, and then you travel to a place where it's not hustle and bustle and things are very slow, you just, just the way that you are, you're active. You know, you... I've I've seen people who have at, who've come to, for example, Houston from other places, and they immediately got plugged in, and they immediately not only did they get plugged in, but they immediately became as involved as anybody else in that city, or even more involved than most. Yeah, and it's just their attitude. It's like high altitude training in Colorado or something. <laughs> exactly. You know how exactly athletes go there. Is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, you're in Chicago, man. What, what, what's, why are you in Chicago? What brings you to our next So I came world? to Chicago to do an event yesterday at Mosque, Mosque Foundation. Uh, alhamdulillah. And it was, it was the first time actually that I came to Chicago to do an event at a masjid. I've been to MSAs before. I've been to Loyola and UIC and, uh, a few others, but, uh, it was really cool. Alhamdulillah. It was really great. Uh, Chicago's got a really, really strong Palestinian presence. Yes, it does. I, 
Mass uh, Foundation, yes. Yes, it was it was really Palestinian, alhamdulillah. So that was <laughs> that was really uh, it was really fun. I, I liked it a lot. It's, Sorry, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Are you here on your own accord? Or are you here through Al Maghrib or No, and I came uh, I came with uh, an invitation from Mosque Foundation. So Mashallah. And I did a program with them. Uh, we did a program on istighfar. They have a, a monthly program. And uh, alhamdulillah, it, it went really well. You had mentioned something, mentioned something before the podcast, which uh, which is one of the Sahabi that intrigues me very much. And you mentioned Kaab ibn Malik. So yeah, so the story of Kaab ibn Malik. So I have a, a, a workshop that I, I prepared. Um, it's a three-hour, kind of sometimes four-hour workshop on the story of Kaab ibn Malik. And... This story for me has a story, and that is that I had the opportunity to go to Medina uh, last year, and I had a friend of mine who's studying at the University of Medina. He was studying there at the time, and he wanted to invite me to somebody who he was like, this guy is like the master murabbi. Like he is, he's not someone famous. You're not going to know him. There are no YouTube videos, but he is a person who takes people under his wing and he develops and nurtures and teaches and things like that. So I'm like, I am definitely want to go see him. So we went. The sheikh has a khutbah jum'ah that he gives in his own masjid in Medina. And then you he crosses the street to his office. And his office is this huge complex. And he, you walk in and he... You walk into his office, and his office is Arab style, you know, seating, all of these beautiful couches with the with the napkins that are in the couches. You know the what I'm talking cushions, about? Yeah, the ground cushions. No, the napkins that pop out of the couches. Oh wow! I've out of the that. cushions of the couches, there's oh, like wow. a they they plug in a napkin holder, and so you'll actually have the napkin coming out of the cushion. So, I thought that was really cool. That's that is cool. pretty cool. And so, basically, uh, we prayed at Masjid Quba, and then we went over to to his office, and then we we. Everybody just kind of filters in and sits down. And he's sitting at the head and he has a, he's got a microphone and he's giving a little uh, He's giving a, a reminder. And he does that every single week. He gives his khutbah. He goes to his office. Everybody comes. There's no invitation needed. Whoever wants to come from the city of the Prophet ﷺ can walk in. Not only does he do that, he gives the mu'idha and then he feeds everybody there from his own pocket. So the, the food is then being prepared. And so people come, they fo- they they listen to the Mu'adha and then they eat and then they interact with him however he wants. So all of those are just beautiful lessons of of serving people, teaching people, feeding people, and he does this every single week. So the lesson that he had, I remember that day. So this is a year and a half removed, but I still remember the 20 minutes that he shared. And he was talking the entire time to build up to a single point. He's telling different stories and he's building up to a single point. And then he says, I'm going to tell you something that Ibn al-Qayyim said. And whoever has the ability to memorize it, memorize it. And whoever can't memorize, then write it down. And so now everybody's pulling out their cell phones and they're writing to type it down. And I'm thinking like, oh my God, I have to, I have to write this down. And he's just, you know, he's building up this, this hype around whatever the sentence is that he's going to say. And then finally he says, Ibn al-Qayyim said that the heart of the one you turn to is in the hand of the one you turned away from. That's it. But the style, the delivery, the way that he presented it, if he had just said that in passing... It wouldn't have been any less of a gem, but I wouldn't have received it in the way that I would have if he had not prepared me to receive it in the way that he did. And so when he said it, I was like, oh, this is incredible that the heart of the one you turn to, that person who you want a job a job from, that person who you are asking for his daughter or that girl who you are asking for her heart, whoever's heart it is, and we all have people's hearts that we want to to turn our way or in our favor he says that heart that you're turning to and that you're so preoccupied by it's in the hand of the one that you're turning away from Hmm. and so if you really want that heart then you're going to ask it from the one who controls the hearts that's the lesson and so that uh sheikh after the that lesson and we we were able to sit down with him he said you're visiting me from america i want to give you some books 
And so he has his own library and he has a gift baskets that he has prepared for whoever wants. Right. And so he gave me a collection of books. And of the books that he gave me was his own research on the story of Kaab ibn Madik. So he, he wrote a book uh, where he has the story of Kaab ibn Madik and point by point, point by point in the story. It's a long hadith, but like almost every other line, he dissects and he extracts all of the lessons from this statement, all of the lessons from this statement, all of the lessons from this statement. So you're analyzing that story part by part. So what I did was I took that book. I turned it into a workshop or I turned it into a course. And then I started going from city to city teaching this workshop. And then what I did was I used the same style in the sense that after every, every line or every stop, uh, I have my lessons prepared and my own added reflections that I added to the Sheikh's presentation. And then I asked the community that I'm in, what lessons do you get? And so now they're giving me more because you know, you get added reflections and added perspectives. And it only, every time I would go to another city, I would just walk out with more and more and more. And so it just became a beautiful journey for me um, in preparation of this Tomorrow Never Came uh, event with, uh, you know, the story of Kaab ibn Madik. So alhamdulillah, it's, it's been going very well and uh, looking forward to, inshallah, benefiting even more with it. You know, I know that the, there's a few books that we've heard of, the jurisprudence of fiqh, you know, fiqh al-sirah. And um, when I first uh, got, you know, came across Sheikh Ramadan al-Buti's um, fiqh al-sirah, I know Muhammad al-Ghazali has one too. Um, and what intrigued me, again, about the same style, you can read sirah as much as you want, right? And the stories are, are, are beautiful and they touch your heart and they bring you close, closer to Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, but this way of teaching, it, you embody the sirah and you start thinking in that sense. If an incident happens to you, I think that's one of the main reasons and the intention behind even the sheikh. What did you say his name was? Uh, that you got the. Book I didn't. From? I didn't mention his name, but his name is uh, Sheikh Yahya. Sheikh Yahya. Sheikh Yahya. So uh, that's the same thing that he does, and he probably doesn't know it. Or I'm pretty sure he knows it. That when somebody reads that style of uh, 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 of writing about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or any other personality, you're building the mind to think in that way. And that's why I think those books, every time I go to those books, even though I may have read like a certain chapter five or six times, but, you know, um, depending on what I'm talking about, it'll always relate in some way uh, to whatever you're discussing. So um, that's actually one of my favorite types of books. It's not just a story, but it's, it's giving you, okay, based on this incident, this is what we're supposed to understand from this. This is what we're supposed to understand from this. And because now, he's making it relevant. It, relevance is the key point, right? And I think that, uh, and we have, even with, uh, with many of our guests, we talk about relevance also. And um, I think that is one of the uh, most difficult things sometimes for people of knowledge or scholars is they have so much knowledge, have compendiums of knowledge in their minds. Um, but relevance is, is sometimes a difficult, uh, uh, concept to, to, you know, to make sure that you spread it to other people. You know, it's, it's not always an easy thing to be relevant or make your, your knowledge, you know, relevant, but yeah. So this is officially launched this workshop or are you, have you started? Yeah, alhamdulillah, I've taught it and uh, get it presented it in a lot of different cities, um, so far. So it hasn't been to Chicago yet, has it? Chicago has not. Chicago it has not. We can do this right now. Then. Let's Go do ahead. It right now. No. <laughs> no. Got, can you just I've give a little fifteen minutes before? It. But for example, like I remember, um, I remember. It. So some of the themes from the story of Kaab ibn Madik is truthfulness. He's saved by his truthfulness. When other people lied to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they said we didn't go out to the battle because of this or that, Kaab ibn Madik is sitting in front of the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he just he just decides I'm going to tell him the truth and come what may. The prov- so that's one of the themes. One of the main themes of the story of Kaab ibn Malik is friendship. He was saved not only because of his decision to make true, to become true, but because he was, he was confirmed in his resolve because he learned that there were two companions who participated in the Battle of Badr who also said the same statements to the Prophet them. And so sometimes you're walking a path and you are strengthened by the presence of other people walking that path with you. And so if your path, if your friends are good, then they're going to strengthen you in the path of goodness. And if your friends are not good, then they are going to weaken your resolve. Kaab ibn Madik decided to be in the company of the companions of Badr, and so he was saved. Also, of the major themes, of course, is Toba. He repents. And so we talk a lot about repentance. Now, there's a statement that I never prepared 
until one of the you know uh, my friends in in the audience in 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 Minneapolis he said look look at that line again and i said okay and that was that when Ka'b ibn Malik his repentance was accepted he walked up to uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he walked up to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the prophet made a statement and he said to him abshir bi khair yawmin منذ ما ولدتك أمك. He said, "Have uh, uh, congratulations on the best day you've ever experienced since your mother gave birth to you." And the hadith continues, but he said, "Just look at that statement. What is the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saying? He's saying that the best day of your life is the day that you repent to Allah. It's not the day that you get got married. It's not the day that you had your first child. It's not the day that you know. Yeah. It's the day that Allah forgives your sins. And so that is just a very heavy." moment from just one line in the story right yeah. and so it just goes on like and that was that was given to me it was gifted to me by one of the the brothers in attendance so it's it's this interactive it's beautiful. experience it's yeah beautiful it's very relative yeah absolutely now before we uh we've got a few minutes left i want to definitely get in the spoken word like you've been in spoken word for seven some years how did you get involved in spoken word honestly so here's the thing you know they, they talk about uh you know, the, this discussion about is a person is a person a painter and that's why they paint or were they a painter um after they painted hmm. you see what i'm saying like are you are you an artist before you make art and that's why you have the ability to make art or do you only become an artist after you um Dabble with the art. Dabble with art. And then you'll find even in the the books they'll say was Allah azza wa jalla al-khaliq before he created or was he always al-khaliq? Like how does that work? So my thing is I just started writing poetry when I um I I think after I graduated from college actually. So I never ever you're talking about a whole lifetime never having written anything, never tried writing anything. And then one day I just wrote a poem and I'm like, "Man, this is fire." This is amazing. What was your inspiration? Because uh, that's the challenge of every artist. That's you're you're trying to look for inspiration before anything. What was my inspiration? Or an incident, maybe? That like, like anything. What would you? What what made you want to write? Like being able to express what made, yourself what that made way. Me, what made me dabble in writing? Probably watching Eight Mile. Okay, that's probably what it was. And you know, you know, you know what's so cool though that that you drew an inspiration just from that movie. Is that you living in this country? We all watch movies. I mean, there's no, there's no, no hiding that. Stuff but, a lot, brother. Movies are haram. Yeah, <laughs> no, especially there, certainly there, there, there are. But, but listen, um, yeah. there there are some benefits to to get from modern art, like movies the and theater, whatnot, yes. and and trying to find some sort of inspiration. That, at least that's what I try to do whenever I, I watch a movie. I try to extrapolate some sort of uh, a benefit or a gem. That can motivate me in my life and and maybe improve my own art. Well, here's 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 my my thing. I believe in art. I believe in the importance of it. One of my favorite uh, phrases that I've heard was, you know, articulating what art is. Is art makes culture felt. Art makes culture felt, and what that means is that, you know, why is it that we all? Um, what brings the ghetto to uh, America. What brings the ghetto to America? What presents the ghetto to America? It's not, it's not uh, research papers. It's not lectures in classrooms. It's art. That's what's got everybody appreciating the ghetto, right? Yeah. It's it's the culture, the hood. And when we talk about Islamic culture, what? Forget that. You know, I have a joke that I always tell people. I met a kid from uh, from from Medina at a university in uh, you know uh, in. In, here in the U.S. and he was he was a foreign student, so he was fresh. He was uh, you know he had all of the 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 he had all of the characteristics of a person you would expect from Medina. He was very uh, warm. He was very soft spoken. He was very gentle. He was just like you know he was almost like a walking symbol of Medina. This guy, hmm. very 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 polite. He was someone that I I became soft spoken in his presence. I became gentle in his presence. Now, he was asking me, he's probably like second year in college and he's, you know, he doesn't speak English well. So he asks me and he says, you know, after spending a good part of the day together, he becomes 
uh, he becomes comfortable with me and he says, Ammar, he comes close to me and he says, I just have a question for you. What's your question? What does shibirti mean? Shibirti. Shibirti. And I go, there's no word called shibirti. And he goes, no, there is a word called shibirti. I'm like, who are you telling? I, I'm pretty uh, familiar with English. There's no word called shibirti. He goes, no, there is. And so I say to him, put it for me in a sentence. And he goes, no, I can't do that. <laughs> and I go, just say, put it for me in a sentence. And then he looks close, he comes close to me and he goes, Go shorty, it's shibirti, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's shibirti. So I'm thinking to myself, what took what took shibirti and brought it all the way from Jamaica Queens and took it all the way to Medina, right? It's art. It's the packaging of art. Yeah. And shibirti didn't just go to Medina, but it went all over the entire world. So that's you know that's that's how America reaches the world. It's through Hollywood. It's through music. It's through all of these things. It's through art. And so for us to not have uh, our voice in the discussion, and not only that, but molding and, and, and giving our, our voice, right? Presenting our voice to, to humanity through art, I think is, uh, is not a wise move. It's, it's, it's a waste of, of such a strong and great opportunity that we have. It doesn't mean... At the same time, it doesn't mean that I have to do everything that's haram because I don't have any creativity. No, creativity or necessity is the mother of invention. Muslims, when they wanted to dabble in art, they didn't adopt the um, the sculpting of, of the Greeks because it's haram for us. So what did they do? They said, we're going to take this calligraphy thing and we're going to master it and we're going to turn it into an art that the entire world will appreciate. And even the tiles, that's the Moroccans do, right? The tiles, and yeah, it's phenomenal. Right. And just to let you know, the only reason I'm laughing is obviously your build up, how you're talking, the Sheikh built up the whole presentation. You built up the presentation, and you mentioned the Shabiriti thing. And to our listeners, he had a serious face. He didn't laugh at all. And he said, I was like, how come this dude's not laughing? Yeah. But, anyways, so no, yeah. Uh, no, but one of the amazing <laughs> things is that, but, but cultivating art and into young Muslims' lives, I think that that's something I'm really passionate about and the ability to express ourselves uh mediums like podcasts or or, or even nasheed or, or whatever it is or spoken word for for example and being able to to utilize that for in their dawah or because people always have this notion that dawah should be you know where i'm going to do an interfaith event or talking to my coworkers or whatever but being able to be creative in the sense where, like, what you're what you're doing, yeah, it's bringing a whole new flavor to the dawah. So, so t t talk us through that a little bit and how so, you got inspired to do I, this. I know people who would never listen to a lecture series. I know them personally; people very close to me. They would never read an Islamic book. When the Umar series came out on NBC, oh, they yeah. watched it all in like three days. Yep. Yeah, before even the subtitles came out, they watched it. And they just consumed it. Why? Because it was being presented in a medium that they that they connected with. For our listeners who haven't heard of the series, it's called uh, Omar. It, and it's been uh, published on YouTube yeah, by and, MS and Mary, not NBC, yeah. uh, MBC. And they did a phenomenal job. It looks very really authentic and how yeah. many parts is it 30 part series yeah it's 30 parts usually the ramadan uh, drama series is that are done in the arab world are 30 parts for every day of ramadan and this was the largest budget yeah. for a, a a a drama ever an arab drama ever so imagine they're presenting their largest budget to the story of amr ibn khattab it was very historically accurate accurate it seemed like you were reading Really, from from books of history. No, then the dialogue is from yeah. like from the books that we've read in our classes and whatnot. Yeah, you you're you're seeing them repeat the same words, and you're I, it brought a smile to my heart because just being able to see a, a real life depiction of that, and I know some it, it rubbed some people the wrong way, but for me, it, it, was, it was it was an amazing uh, production, and it is really needed in a time where movies and, and TV is dominating exactly. everyone's living rooms. And yeah. I, I, it was an amazing experience just sitting down with my family and, and watching that series. And before we get to your spoken word portion, I know we're dragging this a little bit, but there's two things that I took from this. Is number one, I knew a lot. I knew lots of learned brothers personally about Sira that they were they were well versed in Sira, and all of them said they were crying when they saw many many of these episodes. The second thing is that. 
um, Muslims were able to see a production by Muslims that didn't seem like it was in the 70s or the 80s. It seemed very nice and it was very relevant. And it was very, very comparable to the series that they that they be marathoning or they be binging on. You know what I'm saying? I mean, how many years were we all watching The Message? Mm. Yeah. You're talking that was about all we had. <laughs> 40 years, 30 years of MSAs having to show The Message. Yeah. That same movie again and, and again. And for its time, it was a Musaf Aqad did an amazing job for his time. Great. But uh, 2015, we were watching that in the schools. In 2014, yeah. I was getting a little old. Yeah, very much. So the the need to create, I think, is is urgent, and it's it's something beautiful. And people are going to make mistakes along the way. I mean, art is it's not it's not it's not this pure experience like you know being in the masjid giving a lecture. That's obviously that's you know that that's the the uh, you know best option, right? Um, as far as you know, making sure that you know things are are seamless and 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 kosher and all of that halal, but when you're talking about, you know, art, you have to almost, you have to accommodate and allow, you have to correct, of course, but you have to allow for the, 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 the ummah to progress yes. and move forward. A lot of people, they just want to shut the doors. You know, that's just the knee jerk reaction. Shut the doors. This is, this is not acceptable. And, you know, let's just follow the strictest opinion with regards to this. But, you know, I love a statement by Sheikh Salman al Oda. He says, and he was talking about photography and how at, during his time when he was, he was growing up, you know, the the overwhelming position was that photography was haram. And then he said, now everybody, almost everybody is okay with photography, even though there was no new research that was presented. There was no new anything. It's just that the wave upon wave upon wave of people saying, we're doing it, yeah. right? Just made everybody finally just catch up. And so he says, it is from the courage of a faqih. It is from the courage of a jurist that they look for the doors that are able to be open and open them and not wait for the people to break them. Yeah. Uh, can, can we get some of your uh, spoken word before we uh, wrap things up? Yeah. So I'll share with you. Um, this is a, a poem that I wrote way back in the day about Chicago itself. It was the first time that I came to Chicago. Talk about relevance, brother. Yeah. Talk about relevance. So it goes, in the land where vivid stories are told. Of great fires, great lakes, and mobsters of old. Championships carried on the dreams of the bolt. The first feeling's nostalgia. Second feeling is cold. Because it was very cold when I got there. In the land where vivid stories of told are fake. Of great fires, great lakes, and mobsters of old. Championships carried on the dreams of the bull. The first feeling's nostalgia. Second feeling is cold. And you'll ask yourself when the weirdness will stop, where gyros are called gyro, soda is called pop. Nonetheless, you participate beyond belief in destroying deep dish pizzas and Italian beef. Walk in the shadows of buildings reminiscent of Gotham on a long winter night surrounded by the majestic and awesome. As a snowflake descends down Magnificent Mile, the ambience of Chicago, you can't help but love its style. <laughs> oh, I like that. I like that ending. Beautiful. 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 Wow. Man, mashallah. Amar, jazakallah for coming through. Um, oh, for Chicago. Dude, you know, we, need, we want some more time with you next time you roll through. How then, yeah. inshallah, man. Yeah. Inshallah. Uh, how can people re uh, find out more about you? Do you have a presence online or any information about your upcoming courses or workshops? Yeah, so everything that I do as far as social media is very simple. It's, it's at Amar Poetry. A M M A R P O E T R Y. Awesome. And that's we, Snapchat, can, that's Facebook, that's Instagram, that's Twitter. Can you find so, you on uh, YouTube too? On YouTube, I have a, 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 a YouTube page that I'm not that great at updating, but inshallah. inshallah. It's hard to keep up with updating. everything. Yeah. So, we're, we're, so if somebody wants to schedule a talk for you, even in Chicago, do they go through Al Maghrib or do they go through you? No, they can go through me. <laughs> just contact me on social media and we'll make it happen, inshallah. But okay. um, yeah, on YouTube, so, if simple. you just Google Ammar Shukri, you should find a, a YouTube channel. And that's A M M A R A L S H U K R Y. All right, I excellent. Did, this was a very free flowing conversation. Alhamdulillah, it was very. That's because uh, we got a man that smooth. three thousand spoken words. It was very smooth. Alhamdulillah. 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 Mashallah. So, for our listeners out there, if you have any questions or comments, you can email us at the Mad Mamluks at gmail dot com. You can also like our Facebook page at the Mad Mamluks and follow our twi follow us on Twitter by the same name. Please subscribe to us on iTunes and Stitcher. And if you have iTunes, please leave us a five-star review, even if you haven't listened to anything. <laughs> for our special guest, Amar Shukri, Sheikh Amr Saeed, Sim, I'm Mahin signing off for the Mad Mamluks. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.